Okay, welcome back to the Peripheral Views Podcast. We are back with another sewed for you guys. Uh, this is another one in the biography series. Uh, this is our third in that series. Um, our previous two were on uh, Sonny Liston, the American iconic boxer. Um, and that was followed up with uh, Wendy Carlos, a beacon and a pioneer of uh, Synthesized music, along with just um, just in general American composition um, in music. So two big ones to kick things off. Um, our newest contribution is going to be today on William E. Fairbairn. Um, Errol, what's going on today? I'm your host, Jake, by the way, and this is uh, Peripheral Views. I'm with Errol uh, as my co-host today. What's going on, Errol? Oh, I'm, you know, having a great time. Um in a uh i'm in a good mood i'm ready to talk about old dangerous dan old dangerous dan one of the most badass nicknames sounds like the old west if if anything right (laughs) dangerous dan the most dangerous man yeah it's beautiful great um yeah no this is a good one we're going to be talking about today um there's some badassery afoot with this uh particular content really pumped to get into it uh, first, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. You know the you know the digs at this point. Uh, at Twitter, you can find us uh, at Peripheral V one two three on SoundCloud SoundCloud.com forward slash Peripheral Views one two three. Contact us by email at Peripheral Views Podcast at Gmail dot um, Most importantly, peep us on the uh, Apple Podcast and Spotify um, platforms for all your streaming pleasures, uh, throw us up in the search bar. If you're coming across us on social media, um, on those two apps for, uh, streaming, uh, mobile streaming specifically. And if you do, please, uh, please be sure to hit that notification bell, um, become a subscriber to those, uh, those streaming channels for us. And if you do, uh, it'd be great if you could please leave us a uh, positive rating and review. Um, that would be super appreciated. We appreciate all the support we can get uh, in the early stages of this podcast. Um, going forward, not a whole lot of housekeeping on this one. The biography series kind of leaves us, um, and especially with this content, um, there's uh, just not a whole lot to dive into in terms of uh, housekeeping, luckily for us. We can, dig, we can dig our teeth right into the actual content of the day. Um, but let's roll into, before we do that, uh, we have a previous episode out. Our most recent one is on the airwaves now. That was the sixth pod- podcast episode overall, and it was an introduction to our ranking show, um, where we uh, we ranked our top five UFC moments of the year. Um, it's a bit of an MMA show, and then we built a fantasy UFC 300 card, which was super fun to do and talk about. Uh, Errol, what did you think about that episode? How did we do? Um, I thought it was really fun. Um, some developments looks like, uh, Jamal Hill ruptured his mm-hmm. ACL or no, sorry, his Achilles tendon, which is arguably the worst thing that can happen <laughs> to oh, yeah. your leg. Other yeah, that's than about as bad as it gets. Short of getting it removed, I would say it's one <laughs> of the things like, or like a knee injury. Like that is no, no, okay. So here's my issue with an ACL, like a full ACL tear is it's um it's under tension. So what happens is say for some ungodly reason, it's snapped at the heel, it shoots up into your butt cheek. Oh. Oh, yeah. so the tendons are all connected, is what you're saying. Like Yeah, well it's one long it's tension. one long tendon down your leg. Right. Oh God. So their their pain is literally the entirety all the way up to your hip. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're, and you gotta you're imagine thinking. there's like a lot of there's a, a ton of nerve endings too. Like that's gotta be I mean, this is why the Achilles heel is always referred to as, as like it, it's if you hit it, yeah. you're done. Like that's like Well, you know the like origin story of like the Achilles, like well, yeah, the, uh, the Achilles dipping, was dipped into the dipped river into sticks. The, yep. Yeah, and just only held by the by the Achilles tendon, which makes it the most like vulnerable of tendons in the body. But it just so happens that that's actually just 
anatomical in a way. Um, right. But yeah, there's a lot of there's so many nerve endings in that tendon. Uh, I feel bad for that dude. He's got a long uh, he's got a really long recovery. I guess like one of the only um, one of the more well known cases of that tendon being ruptured was the Kobe was a Kobe Bryant uh, injury later in his career. He got like he had the exact same injury where it ruptured. Mm-hmm. Um, and you got to imagine basketball impossible, like impossible right. to play like through anything even so, like that. But yeah, like you have to do like cuts and stuff. But like, I mean, I feel like it's more reasonable if you like are in shape and like you get back in shape to do it. It's a whole nother thing to be in fighting in the UFC. Cause like, if I'm, if I'm nice with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, man, I'm going straight for a heel hook, bro. I'm winning the title. <laughs> I'm killing yeah. you. You never yeah. walked again. Yeah. You yeah. said it was the left leg. That's all you'd see me in practice, just flying scissor heel hook. Flying scissor heel hook. Yeah, like, but it, that's a that's so that, that's what that's what's so crazy. And I want I do wonder this if this is largely true. And it kind of it really depends on like how injuries recur over a career. But like this is with like, all athletes, I feel like. Um, and, and honestly with just people in general and injuries, like usually when you do have an injury, like the body will actually produce the, the recovery will produce a stronger tendon or ligament. Um, just like it does a bone, like the bone, if you break, like you'll get aches and you're probably more prone to like arthritis if you break bones, um, later in life, but the actual likelihood of breaking the same bone twice is, I think it's pretty unlikely because I think the bone like calcifies a little bit more like st- like stably it's kind of the whole basis behind uh, like muay thai f- fighters uh micro fractures micro fractures just, right that's why they kick yeah. like tree trunks yeah if you just kick something hard all day and break your break your shins they'll calcify and also like deaden the nerves and stuff i feel like there's like a kind of a truth to that or you could just go yeah. full conor mcgregor and just like get a titanium leg and like you know just that works too. That's have definitely gonna be that. stronger than yeah. I mean, have fun with that. I mean, just one check. Just all it takes one one <laughs> check. Okay, kick kick that fight. leg. Check that <laughs> check that leg kick and and that, that'll, be, that'll be the last leg kick I have to take today. Just make sure you check the first one. Yeah, but um, then you know the other one's fair game, but you gotta yeah, that's true. swing in that thing like a club. Yeah, and then you got like the stance switching and all that that goes into that that strategy. But yeah, I feel bad for Jamal Hill. That's a tough, that's a tough break. Uh for him because he just uh, he got the opportunity it's so strange too because he got the opportunity because yuri prohachka uh he vacated or relinquished the same way because of a shoulder injury yeah, the shoulder that's the only reason jamal hill was in a title fight back in january to even have the opportunity to become a, a ufc champ because prohachka had relinquished um, due to a, like a elongated injury, which he's actually going to probably, well, I always, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because there's a further development. Um, so that belt is now up for grabs. That 205 UFC light heavyweight belt is now officially up for grabs. Um, it's vacant because he relinquished. Um, so, uh, Alex Pajeda is fighting Jan Bohovic in two weeks, right? In two, two weeks from Saturday or no, a week from Saturday. So it's even, oh, yeah. even sooner. Um, and there's like obviously there's like some rumors that that they're just going to turn that into a title fight, um, but they were but Yuri Prohashka was promised a title fight when he would return if he relinquished, which he did back last year. So like he's going to walk right into a title fight if Pahita is holding that strap um, when Prohashka is ready at the end of the year to fight. We're getting one of my fantasy UFC 300 fights like Pronto. Like, it's going to be Pajeda and Prochka throwing down, which I even said, I think, in the podcast I'm recording that sneaky, that's like quietly, that's one of the um, most exciting fights in the sport, in my opinion. It's just like two high level strikers, chaos, violence. Somebody's, it's just a guaranteed like firefight. Um, and it's like, it's actually kind of like, the pathway to that fight is as clear as is day. It's just, it's literally a couple of uh, just a couple of strokes uh, from being a reality. So we'll see what happens. Looks like it. Yeah. I know. I think you're right. It looks like it is on the way. Yeah, it could be. It, it's just a matter of like where the championship goes. And I think in order for that fight to happen, Pajeda has to win next Saturday. If he beats Jan Blachowicz, then I think that's, undoubtedly going to whether it's for the belt vacantly or maybe he's already holding it 
I think that's probably going to happen, which is, I'm telling you, people might even sleep on it after it's booked, if it's booked. Like, people will probably sleep on that fight, but uh, I guarantee you they won't sleep on it after it happens because it is. Gonna, I've got my eyes on that fight as being like an all time classic, but we'll see. See what happens. Um, anything else uh, in the world of MMA that uh, pertains to our previous content, Errol? Uh, nothing, nothing I can think of. Yeah, relatively quiet in that uh, on that front. I mean, it's never too quiet in that in that world. But um, in terms of what we discussed, um, you know, we're in the second half now, so there's there's going to be some uh, exciting stuff coming up. Uh, obviously, UFC you got Poirier Gagey coming up. Uh, next Saturday, that's a big, it's a big time fight. So a lot of good fights coming up. But uh, in terms of that episode and its um, the content within it, no big updates um, as of yet. But uh, we'll be keeping our eyes peeled, and we'll circle back to MMA in a in a future episode. So content of the day, though, we're going to talk about William E. Fairbairn. Um, I had a, uh, I just want to touch on a couple of the uh, source materials. I, I. Uh, I'm going to be referring to out in front as a bit of a disclosure. This is kind of a new style of formatting for the podcast. I just wanted to be up front with where I got my uh, source material. Therefore, if we do have inaccuracies on uh, the stories of these individuals, I noticed this a bit with the Wendy Carlos uh, episode is that I was referring to a biography about her that had been um, disavowed by her personally. Um, so I wanted to avoid that or at least disclose what my sources were up front. Therefore, if I do refer to them, refer to those sources in the recording, we can, um, we can either discard them or, um, you know, at least, at least those sources will be known in, uh, in advance. So, um, for me, I found a pretty good, uh, one of the better sources I found was at, uh, pewpewtactical.com, which is what do you think about that name? I mean, come on, Errol. That's that's like that's just great stuff. I, I like. I genuinely want to dive into that uh, that website just without the content. You know. Um, but yeah, so pewpewtactical.com, uh, picture from history, the article on William Fairbairn. That's the um, an examination of his uh, of his life. Um, Badassoftheweek.com had a pretty hilarious, uh, it's an interesting website. It's, it sounds like it's pretty, uh, they also had a few sources that they referred to, some of which was Wikipedia, but they did a pretty funny uh, comedic style um, uh, piece of uh, writing about it that was good to source. Um, obviously, his Wikipedia page, which uh, has all the sources you need there as well. Um, and I actually referred a bit to his, uh, his own writing from the book, Get Tough, uh, by W.E. Fairbairn, our, um, our content of the day. So, uh, those are my sources. Errol, do you want to disclose yours ahead of time? Is that, uh, something you've got prepared? Uh, yeah, no, I got a couple things, uh, actually, uh, just lying around. Uh, good old Wikipedia. Wikipedia is great. It did not help that much in this okay. case. Not with his story. It's Wikipedia is really nice, but you're absolutely right. There was um, it's a short, it's a pretty short. I mean, in terms of his content, just in general, he's uh, his biographical story is is tough to get. I mean, listen, he was uh, and we'll get into this, but he was you know uh, more so famous, and we'll be talking mostly about his like martial arts mastery um, outside of the um, you know establishment or the uh, military establishment. So therefore, like, it's not, it's actually not, it's very unsurprising that his story was a little bit kept under wraps. Well, yeah, like it's, he, oh, fast, or like quick fact, it's uh, theorized that he might be the, uh, 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 like, the original person who, uh, who like put forth, or not put forth, but he was, uh, uh, they might have uh, based James Bond after his life. Interesting, really. Yeah, he's a possible wow, inspiration know. for a Q branch. Interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's that's interesting to know because uh, I got to tell you that doesn't surprise me after whatever. Although I think he's a lot more fucking rugged. <laughs> like, yeah, no. If James Bond was William Fairburn, it wouldn't be like gadgets. It'd just be like he just killed him with a shoelace. Like what? Yeah, the- no. Yeah, I, in my opinion, like I, I get, I get where the inspiration could be because because it's hand to hand. He was it's commando style. It's um, espionage well, across the world. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a Even lot Even though William, that. he wasn't really like an espionage. He was more so a... Not necessarily, no. Street fighter, really. He yeah, was just like handling a, the he <laughs> police. Was, he's handling police riots and shit. But. Yeah. He was but there. anyway, so we'll, 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 that'll be a perfect segue. Let's just dive right into it. Um, so Lieutenant Colonel William Ewart Fairbairn uh, was a British Royal Marine and police officer. He developed hand-to-hand combat methods for the Shanghai police during the interwar period, as well as for the Allied Special Forces during World War II. And he created his own fi- fighting system known as Defendu. Uh, notably, this included innovative pistol shooting techniques and the development of the Fairbairn Sykes fighting knife, which is a really cool weapon to take pick, uh, take a peek at the pictures of. Um, and as, as we were just discussing. So that's kind of where we're at with him, uh, just in a summarization uh, sense. Errol, uh, let me circle right back to you so you can finish up your sources uh, before we get to. I just wanted to lay out a little bit of groundwork about who we're talking about. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, um, yep, Wikipedia. Also, uh, can't really uh, you can't really rely on the local library, depending on where you are for a lot of uh, the stuff. His books, All in Fighting, Get Tough, Shooting to Live, uh, technically, or like the in the Defendu, it's not really stuff that uh, the, the community wants you like reading at least like comfortably. So, um, but yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, needless to say, you're, you're on a list. Like, yeah. <laughs> if you did rent it from a library, like if it's there, it might be bait, but like, you know, no issues with that. No. Uh, what I did do ever since um, I was there, I just looked up, uh, I looked up uh, modern China and illustrated history by uh, J A G Roberts. Mm-hmm. Um, I was there today again, so I picked up uh, Print the Legend, The Life and Times of John Ford by uh, Scott Iman. And that is just because that's the gentleman who uh, filmed all the old timey, like uh, December 7th, 1941. Well, not all of them, but like uh, the uh, the United States uh, Defense Ministry gave him like a lot of money just to make a you know the combat videos and like stuff like that mm-hmm. and like you know using your bayonet and like your rifle and you stuff like that right, um, yeah. just the old timey like uh uh i don't know i think they're like really campy i think i i think they're it's really great campy. yeah the tutorials like the tutorials yeah. of like a hand of hand weapon use like yeah this is now that will show stuff. the Jerry's. You're gonna take your <laughs> hand. You're gonna shove it right where the sun don't shine. Well, it's because people were just so like awkward about. Uh, they were <laughs> they were so just uh, bizarrely awkward about how about talking about. Um, I think cameras kind of did that to folks when they were when they knew they were recording, and it was just kind of a new technology. And there was like people were still trying to develop ways to communicate whatever they were trying to. Uh, communicate to the masses via you know record audio recording or video recording whatever it was it was it was a newer technology so i think it just comes off a little bit uh it's 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 square when it should be cool you know right i, I bet it was wicked cool at the time um it's yeah i think it's it actually ages kind of well um it probably was not as um I don't know. It wasn't probably as captivating for the general public at the time or um, probably 20 years after, but like at this stage, it's far enough, far enough out. It's like kind of like a time capsule. But a lot of those videos, like you just had to watch if you're in the military, like it was just like, um, also a big, uh, uh, they're very big into the transatlantic uh, accent. So you could show it to both uh, British and American troops. Perfect. And that was also a uh, Hollywood back in the day. They used sure to was. Atlantic, so uh, yeah. you could. That's old fucking. That's old like uh, uh, Cary Grant and just all those all those like big time Hollywood actors. They all spoke in that in that transatlantic accent. That's that's so yeah, just the times. Just the uh, the the accent that everyone knows but doesn't actually exist. Like it's it's so it's not weird. real. Yeah, yeah, it's so weird to hear. Well, it's so strange because you you you'll watch a film like. Um, I don't know, like Casablanca or something, and like you don't question it, like right, you don't question it at all. I know, I do. honestly I because I talk back in the day. it's in, yeah, it's so interesting because like nobody actually did talk like that in real life. They just talk like that in the moving pictures, but <laughs> they, but they definitely were. Um, that must have been weird at the time to some degree for like I don't know for any viewer or 
um, just the general public. But like, like I said, I think it just comes off that way because, but like, it might not have been weird because like the technology itself was weird. Like movies were right. still pretty new. And so were like tutorial videos or whatever you want to call them. And even radio, like all that technology, it was like less than a hundred years old. So like people were still probably getting accustomed to them in some capacity. So like the way that people spoke on them, on those mediums were probably like, you know, they were probably this must be just how they talk on the moving pictures and in the uh, on the transistor radio. You know what it was? It was lazy writing. <laughs> so they had to spice it up with a well, phony accent. <laughs> no, it's just so you could you could have like a person who's from like Brooklyn in America, then have someone who's from like you know England, and then mm. have them do like an English accent, then have the one guy do a Brooklyn accent, but they're like. No, just read the paper. They're like, don't build a character behind it. They're like, ah, oh, geez, Janice, what do we do? Like, like, you don't need to be like, oh, geez, Janice, like, yeah. what's going on over you here? You got to play, like, play it straight, play it right down the middle because we got an right. yeah. to capture. And you got and you got to say it quick because the longer we film, the more it cost, honey. I kind of like it. It's nostalgic. I, I, I do I, like it. I like it too. I think it's like it's like very charismatic and like kind of snappy. And it's, Dude, it's I'm quick. A, I'm starring against my will in another play. It's uh, mm-hmm. the Great Gatsby radio show. Oh, you should throw that in the mix. On so the, I, on I the would, lines. I would, but I got roped into it. So um, mm-hmm. I told him I didn't really want to do much, and I wanted to kind of sit in the back, go and help out, and I'd do the foley work. I'd be the foley artist. I'm nice. Like, yeah, okay. don't even need to audition your cast. I was like, perfect. Um, it's a radio show. It's a play oh. of so it's a play of a radio show is what it is. Oh, I see. Okay, of a play, right? Yeah. So I need to portray the foley artist. I was like, you guys wrote me into this. I was like, that was a. I was like, you guys tricked me. So like, I actually have to be on stage playing the foley artist while doing the. Play. Yeah, but like, there are a- listen. There are worse. Um, there are worse. There's worse material to have to do that for. I mean, it's right. Scott Fitzgerald. I mean, you're working with you're working with a like one of the great american authors so oh yeah so like that that too i was like if i have to do anything i'm just gonna sit back and like there's scenes where i have to like mix drinks because you know them they're all uh they're all, oh yeah they're always drinking around so i'm gonna well my character like put his legs back for the fully work and like mix up like a drink <laughs> like just like <laughs> drink it when it's done by like you know <laughs> oh my job's done and then like when the next scene comes like oh i gotta do like the car thing i'm like oh. yep quick like, switch yeah, like I want to be like just good enough at my job to be comfortable with it, but like bad enough to be like, oh, look well, around excellent. and like, yeah. yeah. Well, that's excellent. I'll keep you busy. But um, yeah, so uh, what do you say? Let's before we get rolling into the, uh, we've laid out the groundwork a bit here. Um, what do you say we just take a short break and then we're going to dive right into the uh, a little bit of the backstory of William E. Fairbairn. We'll talk about where he's uh, coming from, where some of his uh, original experiences um happened and what they and how they impacted um what came next and what he pioneered so hang tight for us for just a few minutes we'll be right back we'll take a short break
Okay, thanks for hanging in there, folks. We are back, um, back with the content for today. William E. Fairbairn. Um, this is our third installment of the biography series on the Lieutenant Colonel. A um, little bit of his background. Um, there's like a like we had kind of disclosed earlier in the uh, in the podcast. There just isn't a whole lot of source material on his backstory, his upbringing, and you know his early life. That stuff is just not really publicly available. Um, he's a bit of he he falls into our um, our category of like uh, you know Errol and I, as it's clearly um, it can clearly be seen in our podcast format. We're like very much into some esoteric topics, and uh, that's what we wanted to dive into on the podcast. And unfortunately, that comes at a bit of a cost sometimes, and especially in this case where we have a, a figure who is monumentally important but doesn't exactly have enough um, research to do a true deep dive on. Um, most, his, uh, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. The most important thing I could find about his childhood, or at least the one thing that stuck out, was um, before he did enlist, um, he, he was not he, of age. Well, yeah, that, that so <laughs> they're like, uh, he's like, I want to join. They're like, how old are you, son? He's like, I'm 15. They're like, no, you're not. You're 18. And he's like, sounds good to me. <laughs> and that was just, <laughs> I, I, no, was I, I picture it more like this. They're like, how old are you, son? And he's like, don't worry about it. <laughs> he's just fucking, <laughs> he's like, 15. He's, he's like, what's fucking, it to you? He's been he's 55 like, stabbing people for his, for, so when he was 15. Here's, his so here's life. the thing. He's here's the thing. You're not too far off. He wasn't a violent child, but um, mm. I heard he worked at a tannery at a uh, like a, with a leather smith. Oh, that, so he that, had a, he that he had boy's a been working with working with knives his whole life. Yeah, in his I don't think he was too. like it was a job that he a job that he did. So if you can cut like tanned leather with a knife and you're used to doing that, believe it or not, human flesh is just. A little bit less than that. So, like, if you're comfortable with what it takes to, like, you know, lacerate leather, tear it up, get a good cut, like, it's not a crazy jump to go to, uh, you know, knife fighting. Well, I would push back a little bit on that, only being that there's, like, there's the old mental hurdle of, like, yeah, this is murder. <laughs> like, that, that it's would murder. be... It's, it's that's a mental hurdle to, like, it's, okay. It's, it's, um, it's a... It's murder if it's not self defense. And it right, and most no, you're right. It is mostly self defense. And I just mean the I just mean the mental hurdle of like. And by the way, like as soldiers, I'm sure that like, and he did uh, he did serve in uh, Korea in the early part of the 19th century or the 20th century, and um, I'm sure he got comfortable with like hand to hand combat and warfare and like having to inflict like you know. Uh, murderous violence we'll call it in in the scenes of warfare so i'm sure that that jump was probably act you're probably right in his case scenario but i do imagine if you know uh, for most uh you know people working in leather shops at the time probably still probably still had a nice mental hurdle to jump over uh to get to to get to taking on the old uh the shanghai gangs as we'll get to momentarily here i mean we're um, talking about the man who wrote killer be killed yeah, yeah, I'm sure. He, I'm sure <laughs> yeah, I think he did. I think he did a double backflip over that hurdle. Yeah, I think you're probably right. <laughs> I think he kicked that hurdle over and just walked right through. <laughs> he took the hurdle and he chucked it at the referee. I'm not jumping full of shit. <laughs> he, killed, he killed the referee with the hurdle. <laughs> yeah, he picked it up and swung it at him, then stabbed him in the face. Um, so yeah, his uh, his backstory. No, that's that's a good tidbit though, because uh, I did not happen to stumble upon that uh, part of his his backstory in his early years. So that's good to know. Um, that's actually pretty relevant too, because you you can make some nice conclusions about that. But um, as we said, he he did try to enlist um, underage, and he was pushed through. Um, what you, how old was he actually? Did you say he's fifteen? Because I read somewhere that he was just a year under at seventeen, but I could be wrong. I've heard I've heard 15, I've heard 16, now I'm hearing 17. Yeah, well, this is 1907 for you, but uh anyway, so he did he did serve in Korea, but um he left Korea um in oh, let's see. Actually, well, this would have been yeah, this was 1901 was when he was in Korea. He served with Royal Marine Light Infantry and then he was um 
he was ordered to the city of Shanghai um, and joined the Shanghai Municipal Police, the SMP. And this was, it would have been, would have been in uh, 1907, um, in which he was serving in the red light districts, um, which really, um, that part of the story is where things get pretty interesting for the, uh, for the individual. Cause this is where he starts to, uh, um, he starts to learn about the, there's a lot of gang violence, a lot of, um, uh, street violence going on and he he got his ass beat at one point if i remember if i remember my reading correctly um that left him like completely bloodied and on the verge of death and hospitalized right yeah if yeah i'm pretty sure yeah and this 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 would actually be one of the bigger inspirations so like um they uh he was he was after being hospitalized from this from this beating he took from a gang um, in Shanghai uh, was when he was inspired to start developing a martial arts, or at least I don't know that he, I don't think he, I don't think he immediately started developing the style of martial arts that. No, would, but he's like, I just can't later. let that happen to me again. Right. So he was just, he decided to become a martial arts master of some kind. And he started doing pretty much everything. Um, uh, boxing, like, wrestling, savage, jujitsu, uh, jujitsu, jujitsu, judo. Uh, he was a, yeah, he was a second Don in judo. Yeah, wasn't which, he the first? He was like the first recipient, Western re- recipient of a black belt by the by uh, Japanese jujitsu um, masters, which um, is like that's a big deal. If that is the case, then yeah, I know that's actually huge. I know he received uh, the Don and uh, second Don in judo, that's but it would make sense deal. that he went back to do it. Yeah, I mean, he just went full. He went full bore. I'm, I'm not gonna let this happen to me um, again. Um, but uh, yeah, the street fighting, the street fighting incident that left that left him stabbed, beaten, and left for dead was one of the pivotal moments. Um, and uh, this this was when the tactical development began um, in the commando style knife fighting um, started being married with the martial arts style of, um, you know, of the things we just mentioned. Um, in one of the first street fights against the game, Fairbairn was out, both outnumbered and outmatched. He was beaten half to death, waking up battered in hospital several days later. It was then he decided he needed to change some things. So yeah, that was the that was the pivotal moment, seemingly. Um, mm-hmm. As I'm reading here from the Pew Pew Tactical article on uh, William Mary Fairbairn. Um, let's see. Uh, going further, so he does. Do you do you have information on when he? Meets uh, Eric Sykes because Eric Sykes is a super important uh, figure in this in his um, story. He was, uh, I believe, they, if I'm not mistaken, Eric Sykes uh, Sykes was also um, in the Shanghai thing. In the SMP, also in the, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, no, um, I think it was later actually. Um, so I think they met actually in World War II um, when he was uh, when Fairbairn was recruited as a British special ops. Um, well, so no, he joined the SMP in 1926. No, oh, Eric Sykes a, did, or yeah, or as an unpaid, Fairbairn. yeah, Sykes did as an unpaid part-time volunteer. In, okay, in so this is pre World War II, so they met before that, but I don't think they started developing the style until the 40s. No, yeah, 1941 is when they developed the, the actual double-edged fighting knife. Um, yeah, and then he was in the SMP from the from twenty six to forty one, where he departed from China in nineteen forty, and then forty one he teamed up after he left. Right. I believe he yep. left with uh, with uh, Danger Dan, and then they're like, "Yo, let, you're we're both pretty cool. Let's <laughs> make a, a better knife." And that knife is still made to this day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's England, what I was they still about. use it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's still, still it's still manufactured it's, to this day in the exact style of being double bladed. For commandos, and in, in, um, you got to know like uh, you can't just like own knives in uh in the UK like that. So like, I imagine you can only get it if you are like, licensed. you know, yeah, like if licensed to kill, yeah, <laughs> only if like you're in the military or something like that. I think I think it's one of those things where you have to like earn it or it has to be passed down or like you can probably get like a bootleg one, but I'm I'm not mm. sure. Yeah, so when he. It up, but. It was interesting too, because like before, even before the the he developed this um, this commando style, like he, I think 
<laughs> I, I, in my head, I was actually comparing this to like a stand up comic who has to like work out material on stage and get like booed off stage because his, his like his new set set list sucks or like he's just he's just bombing um, because he's working out new material. Yeah, unfortunately, he went through something similar in Shanghai um, because over the course of time as he was developing this, he 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 actually had to get he, he was part of a special anti riot squad. And he um, he was involved in like, I think at the end of the day, they tallied up um, on record uh, over 600 gang related street fights, 600 um, non training fights is like, <laughs> yeah, is the, Much is the police record. <laughs> yeah like, so the they could count it they could right. count that place. much as much of that was taking place in, in the red light districts in shanghai and they were like and and these were by the way remember these are not like it's amazing that he survived so many of them um, because these were not there were knives involved it wasn't it's just credited uh, um so one he's credited with having scars from his like ankles to like you know his like like his neck jesus um yeah, covered in scars, but the sh- the red light di- district in Shanghai was um, arguably the most dangerous place to be in the world at that time. Um, so there was a it was a melting pot. Um, mm-hmm. The reason why uh, the SMP was there is because, um, if I'm not mistaken, there was a uh, like an intercultural area where like England, Japan, like United States, like there were they just owned a piece of land and um, you could just like do business. There was like an international hub. You could just do stuff like out of China, like living oh, there. This, was, like, this would have taken, this would have taken the place of like the world trade center in, in New York. Pretty, yeah. Exa- yeah. Just a, just a hub where like people would just live. There was like, um, I think like 40,000 people at some time. And like, you know, that's where the money's at. So, you know, there's going to be crime there. Um, well, not the, like the red light district, but uh, uh, where was it at? It was like by uh, there was a need for it. Uh, either way, yeah, red light district in uh, Shanghai was not a uh, fun, not a safe place to be. Yeah, and he, I don't know the fact that he lived enough to yeah. tell the tale like that's a no. I heard well, I heard this the scar situation too. I read I read that along my, along the way and like that's what makes it so impressive that he like survived all that. But um, I guess that he also was like um, responsible for like um, for developing a bulletproof vest um, that stopped high velocity bullets. So small, like, and, I don't know. small and large caliber. Right. He, uh, yes, that's right. Yep. So on top of just working on the uh, training courses, because he's like, look, this is not because what they used to do, it was, um, Three, like I guess he stepped up after there was like a particularly violent altercation where uh, some person got shot. But this is the time where they were uh, like, you know, as the police like about face stand like borderline dueling pistol. Like you just stand up straight, like arm to the right. Boom. He's like, you got to take cover. He's like, you got to take cover. <laughs> you got to like, you know, if you're knife fighting, you got to keep swinging, keep him out of the way. Like he's like, we got to start moving, man. He's like, you got to not die. So, um, yeah, he uh, he started uh, revamping the training courses, the police equipment. And then, yeah, he uh, was using uh, metal line bulletproof vest to stop a uh, small caliber. And then he and then they upgraded to high caliber that could stop like a Mauser, which was just a bit had a bit more stopping power. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. No, this was like um, this. This this man had he had his um, he had all fronts covered in terms of like just combat just straight up combat i mean this this man lived and breathed it which we you actually mentioned in the previous previous episode what a like great transition from like an mma episode into this was and it, it actually does serve as one um he's quoted as saying in the uh, get tough book um concluding like the intro he says um quote i should like in conclusion to give a word of warning almost every one of these methods applied vigorously and without restraint will result if not in the death and certainly in the maiming of your opponent. Extreme caution then should be exercised in the practice, care being taken never to give a blow with full force or a grip with, with maximum pressure. But once closed with your enemy, give every ounce of your effort you can muster and victory will be yours, end quote. Um, I mean, savage, savage all the way through. And But the interesting thing is, is that he knows the level of danger involved um, in inflicting 
this 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 type of uh, fighting style, uh, especially with weapons, uh, you know, knife weapons. Um, but I always I find it interesting in that quote that he's um, basically kind of disclaiming a little bit, not disclaiming, but um, proclaiming that there's like caution that you should exercise some caution when when practicing these things. When in actuality, he was practicing them in the streets of Shanghai. Um, yeah. Where like where like he actually he, it seems like he actually truly had to I don't, I'm sure he was he was training with like obviously jujitsu masters Japanese jujitsu masters and uh, Chinese boxing gyms and there was probably a lot of training going on but if you're going to accrue over 600 street fights mostly in Shanghai um, you're probably getting you're probably going full force with most of your opponents in those scenarios and uh, he just lived it and breathed it I mean, if you if you look at page 11 of get tough it's just a figure figure 11 figure 12 and it's just this guy jumping up in the air knees bent to like just legs extended um this man wrote the book on mortal combat fatalities and like super moves he's like all you got to do is just like take the knife stab him in the neck like you know <laughs> pull it down and then like and you want to hit him with a judo toss, and then he yeah. should be dispatched. Well, he was true MMA in a way because he did, he genuinely he was like the first MMA artist in a lot of ways. It's, like um, if you think about it, because he did come he combined he combined boxing, wrestling, jujitsu, uh, judo, yeah, and absolutely. all the Chinese martial arts, and he combined them all in, in like with with like a fighting systematic in his quote is quoted as the defendu style. Um, in a lot of ways, it truly, I, I genuinely think he may be in some ways the inventor of, of mixed martial arts. The grandfather of uh, MMA. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I'm, I, listen, I'm sure there are, um, I'm sure there are cases of like cross training between, you know, uh, between masters of different domains, especially in like uh, certain doju, dojos, but like, from what I can gather, this is one of the first examples, the earliest examples that I can see of like not just training, but implementation in like social uh, experimentation of these of these styles of fighting. Um, but like the most the most interesting aspect is that like this is with like with weapons too, because this is this is pure self defense in the most literal sense. Yeah, they one of the say hubs in the world. Yeah, like one of the quotes is like, if you ever have to use these tactics, like. Uh you're a poor fool like you should have a weapon or like at least like a knife on you like if you have to <laughs> if you right, need to yeah. hit someone with the you know hip toss like here's how you do it but you shouldn't really need to yeah yeah no and no uh, we should talk a little bit about um before we move on too far um i just wanted to talk about um about get tough because uh I, I that's that seems like it's the book i don't know if it I, I, he has several um I'll pull up his uh, obviously the books that he did write. Um, he's got a few publications and um, Defendu. As there is a publish publication called Defendu, um, Scientific Self Defense in 1931, All in Fighting in 1942, Get Tough also in 1942, uh, Self Defense for Women and Girls um, 1942, Hands Off Self Defense for Women published also in 1942. God damn, he was on fire in 1942. Uh, yeah, cranking him out. Another one, Shooting to Live. This was co-authored with Sykes, also in 1942. And, uh, you know, that's... And then there were some compilations that were made after in, you know, I believe are posthumously... Um, Dude, compiled. page 61. He's like, if you need to, you can just pull the Batman versus Bane panel and pick someone up and break their spine over your knee. He's like, just pick them up, invert them, Drop down, <laughs> just like what, dude? What was well, he was just sitting there in the lab cooking? Like, all right, yeah, you pick him up and just push, split him. In I was half. gonna say that is a little. That's a little like um, there. And, and, I, and this isn't to be critical, but I do mean this, and I mean this genuinely. You're talking about the back break. Yeah, uh, <laughs> like, 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 the book is in a lot of ways like super comical because there are like figures and like. It's just like it's just the fig the figures you you actually Yo. can use in the book. There's like there's just like these dummies and they're like the moves you would have to be doing you can only perform these on a dead corpse, like some of these moves, which is it yeah, makes it a little the, funny. Here's the thing, Jake. If I come around the corner and I see 
an American soldier without a weapon, and then he just <laughs> yoinks old Friedrich. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> picks him up and hits him like that, dude. I'm throwing my guns to the ground before <laughs> before <laughs> Friedrich's <laughs> limp body hits the ground, and he looks at me and he says, "Help! No way, dude. I'm nope." But what's you with know. what's with figure sixty eight? There's uh, so this is like terrible audio, and we won't talk. We won't like deliberate on this for too long. But um, in like figure sixty eight, there's some of these moves where like he genuinely looks like he's got him like I don't know if he's maybe got he's got like a double hand lock and on a on his opponent, and he's just got his wrist up in the air with his foot on his rib cage. And it's just like what? How is this going like, to happen? What how is, is this going to? Uh, how are we going to wind up in this position? Is the question. It's the um. It's the one thing. It's like uh, how to draw. What is it like? How how to draw like a horse? It's like draw a circle. Like draw some lines, and it's like just add the details, and then he's on the ground and he's dead. Look at him. Yeah, he's perfect. Do is just grab his wrist. Well, the very following one is like about like um. About like the chair, the chair and knife. <laughs> he like which is a good move. It's a, not a bad move to pick up a knife, flip it upside down. And who has not been in a scenario where like they've fantasized about like, oh, if I were attacked in this moment, like I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna grab the chair, like and flip the chair upside down like a fucking lion tamer, and like rush a uh, rush your opponent like in a in a scenario as like a, a, a self defense mode. Like the chair is a pretty good weapon. It's not even a weapon. It's just like a shield. Um, although in the figure in Get Tough here, um, this stage in the book, if it, for listeners interested, um, you know, looking through the illustrations of this of of William E. Fairburn's Get Tough book, this is a great one because he uses it as a shield and then he just thrusts it at the guy's throat and just catches him with one of the legs in the throat. <laughs> it's like he turns the shield into the weapon in a way that like it's it's really to block a knife uh, exchange, but. Um, I don't know. Some of them are a little unrealistic, but like then again, I think I think more so it's just about the message. There's a lot of like actually there's one about smacking the ears, the old the oh, old yeah, double ear smack. Well, that's why did you like you know that they do that like if you're watching a UFC fight and they're like they're in a clinch up against the state or up against I'm sorry the cage, and they're you'll see one of the fighters will will like smack the ear. And like I always thought, um, I always thought that that was like a, a motion towards like, oh man, it sucks to get like open hand, open palm smacked in the ear. Like nobody wants to get hit in the ear, Fight Club style. Like that shit sucks. It hurts a lot. Um, but actually, what they're really trying to do is they're trying to pop their eardrum. They like cup their the bottom of their palm and try to like pop the eardrum and blow it out so they can't hear their corner. And also, like it sucks to not hear, and it probably hurts too. But, um. But the, the old double ear smack is like that's got to be in the streets. That's about as effective as you can be, um, dude. He's saying if you cut someone's brachial artery half inch below the skin, you'll lose consciousness in fourteen seconds and be dead in a minute and a half. Good, take a Christ. little bit longer for the radial at your wrist, but like conscious thirty seconds, you're not dead in two seconds. What the fuck? I- yeah, that's what I mean. Is like some of this is pretty unrealistic, and like going through the illustrations, um, as I did research for this, I found most of it like more comical. But there is some like, listen, anything is self defense is self defense. Like if you are fending off an assailant, like you do what you got to do, and if you've got a million ideas in your head about how to defend yourself, like it is nice to have like visualizations of how to, um, you know, in a scenario, how to defend yourself is like. And he also does. He also obviously has books dedicated to like women and girls to defend themselves, um, who are typically smaller and more helpless in in these types of scenarios. So like, it is kind of nice to have the illustrate. I'd rather you have an abundance of of illustrative scenarios. Um, too much is better than too little, right? Yes. Oh, exactly. Just knowing like what what you can do, what could be possibly done. You know, maybe, because maybe you are kind of small, so you're not going to bang, get your back broken over someone. But then some dude picks you up, you're like, yo, I be- oh, no, he's going to back break. <laughs> he's going <laughs> to hit me with figure 68. Oh, you got <laughs> to flip out of that. Bro, that's like, that's like the old fucking Triple H. She just picks you up over your shoulders and just yeah, drops you down on that knee. 
Right. So you got to hit him with the six one nine Ray Mysterio. You got to. You know something. what? I, you know what this book reminds me of too is like um, this book. When I was going through it, I was thinking to myself, like Jesus. Well, you mentioned it earlier that like there was like an inspiration. He was an inspiration for a character in uh, the James Bond series, uh, Q Branch. Yeah, well, he, he, well, yeah, the just Q Branch is like uh, just what James Bond like worked for, like so. Like the oh, okay, the, the Secret Service or whatever. Yeah. Right? Well, like I was sitting here as I'm reading this book, I'm just like, you know, I got a, I got a lurking suspicion in the back of my mind that the, de- that the 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 writers or developers of the James Bond movies and like some of these other ones, like in order to develop like escape scenarios and like action sequences, they just said somebody get me a copy of Get Tough. <laughs> Do you want to and know something just, crazy? There's hundreds. I mean, there's literally hundreds of like scenarios that you could dude, develop an action sequence out of. Dude, speaking of writers, there are a lot of uh, cases where stuff like that has happened. So Tom Clancy uh, was a salesman. Um, but his stories were so detailed that people assumed he was ex-military. Really? Um, oh, so he actually wasn't. Uh, he didn't have history as a military member? No, member? he was interrogated. What? Oh, yeah. he was that good. Yeah, he just oh, used shit. logic to figure like the most like efficient way inside of like a ship and like how it would possibly be be laid out. Wow, interesting. And like, how do you know that? And he's like, because look at the ship. He's like, yeah. He's like, look at it. He's like, you're gonna have the the engine down here, of course. And he's <laughs> oh like, there's God. bunks over here. He's like, there's no way you could know that. He's like, no way, zero possibility. Um, Stanley Kubrick for Doctor Strangelove. He's like, how do you know about the details of those bomber patterns? He's like, <laughs> yeah. he's like, what do you mean? He's like, it's just that's the line. That's about as far. This is how far Russia would be able to push out, and you would probably be right nah, around Kubrick, here. Nah, Kubrick was connected. Kubrick was, <laughs> yeah, he was just deep state connected. He was under the surface. Yeah, the I'm DOD. Kidding, joking, but... The DOD asked him questions. Like, what are you doing? And he's like, you. How would you know about the war room? Um, Cleve Cartmill uh, was describing a nation at war secretly working on an atomic bomb mm-hmm. in 1944. <laughs> <laughs> so the FBI is like, "What do you you got? You can't publish this." And then he's like, "What are you guys working on a bomb?" And they're like, "Uh, uh-uh. he's like, well, if I don't publish it, it's going to be more suspect." He's like, "If I just don't do it, he's like, wow." He's like, just, um, but then he's like, how do you possibly know how nuclear fission works? He's like, because I went to school and I just like, it, a lot of they're just guessing. They're like, yeah, if you just, <laughs> like, if you just uh, have a crazy reaction, then you contain it and then you like explode that, then like it's gonna, and they're like, oh, he knows too much. Like, it, yeah, just like, quote unquote, like a, like a, like realistic fiction. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, this is like this is like the craziness of like, or well, I mean, the truth is always, as they say, the quote is that you know, truth is always stranger than fiction. But mm-hmm. uh, sometimes, the tr- sometimes fiction is the truth, and it just happens to, to easy to arrive. With, with easy to yeah. it's easy to arrive at the truth if you're trying to uh, make something realistic. Yeah, no, and especially for writers when they have like an incentive to be to live as close to reality as possible in their like in their art form um this is um this is like a prime example of of that um but uh yeah i think i personally think william fairbairn has a lot this man in my opinion has a lot he owes he's owed a lot more um credit i guess you could say like social credit or historical credit for a lot of different things and one of them genuinely is some of the uh some of the action sequences you see in film and in uh Tom Clancy stuff too, I guess. You would imagine he must be he must be familiar. I mean, how do you yeah, write an action like, sequence? At least and not like you got to familiar with this. You got to have a cool uncle, right? You know what I mean? Like about friend or something. Yeah, Bill Fairbairn. Oh, Bill! <laughs> Danny, down the road. Want to talk to Dan? You've <laughs> never heard about Danger Dan. <laughs> But yeah, no, he, that's what I'm saying. He had to have known a guy, unless he really was just the coolest guy. He's like, oh, I missed out on the military. If it wasn't for that bum ankle, man, I would be open up to <laughs> SWAT team. He's like, this is how I would do it. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, yo, you know too much. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> it's just like a med like you know um just uh like the stolen valor kind of all oh, right yeah like yeah, how people sure. like oh yeah i serve like, just, like shush, just like yeah just shush about but, it don't say more like just him, take the credit yeah like him he's like oh, i don't even need the like this is what I, what i would do like you know what i mean he's like instead mm-hmm. of just going out there and just buying like a mill serp jacket he's just like yeah no i was deep down in there we we're there is a uh, ties with russia were slipping <laughs> like I, was, <laughs> like I mean it's just, just storytelling <laughs> it's, just, it's just great storytelling it's so um, good that um they just how do you it's so good that they just uh made it like a not only is it like a best-selling book it's like a best-selling like video game oh right yeah like the splinter cells yeah and like rainbow yeah. six siege it's like a Bro, rainbow, rainbow six not to not to tangent too much on tom clancy but like rainbow six was like that entire game series is one of my all time favorites. Like, you don't get Call of Duty without Rainbow Six, in my opinion. Yeah, if it wasn't so popular. Mm-hmm. Rainbow Six, Splinter Cell, Splinter Cell was a little bit um, slower um, and like a little bit more like obviously plot driven, but Rainbow Six, one of the greatest. Um, anyway, so um, let's move. Let's circle a little bit back to Fairbairn here. Um, yeah. So. Then so- he- I'm sorry. Go ahead. You asked. You had a place to yeah. pick up. Take it yeah. Yeah. Um, so a lot of these things you'll notice, like when it comes to the knife fighting or when it comes to just the uh, defense tactics, it's like mm-hmm. weird that like it's weird that like no one wrote them down and like uh, these were like kind of the first people to like start like all right, this is what you got to do. You got to karate chop them in the throat. You got to stab them in the eye. But um, what they say in level of importance when it comes to knife fighting. Um, is uh, you want to go for hands, <clears throat> you want to go for eyes, and then like uh, neck, and then like arms and stuff. So it's like, so it's like hands, eyes, face, neck, and then just like anything else. You just want to keep it up. Also, in a fight too, you'll notice a lot of groin strikes in the, in this book. Neom in the I mean, groin. this is the most dirty fighting of all time. Right. It's as, it's as like it's as ruleless as you can imagine. So, but. Those are vulnerable limbs. Like that makes a lot of sense. Like, especially the neck, the neck and like, you want to go for arteries, like, uh, instill panic in your opponent. So here's the thing that has made sense time, like time and time again, to the point where if you research monkey attacks, they don't need to write it down. They go for the hands, face and uh, groin. Oh, they so will, he was just playing on evolution right there, like ev- it's on an just evolutionary basic, biological yeah, level. Legitimately, like it is. So technically, it is the most like effective thing to do if you're fighting someone. So if you're in a knife fight and you cut their dominant hand with a knife, they can't switch it back to the other one. And then if you cut that other hand with a knife, you now you can fight them. You know what I mean? What are they going to do? Like kick you? Yeah, it's like you, it's, it's the act of disabling your opponent of of their strengths. Yeah. So like hands breathing. Wrist, I forgot you want to hit him with the wrist. Right, breathing and and like controlling uh controlling limbs. Yeah, a good fight is a back and forth where you break, break it. you like barely make it out. Like a great Straight fight up, is I gotta be honest just though, dies. I gotta be honest though, the eyes well I'll I'll tell a, a personal anecdote quickly just to explain my position, but like my one year old daughter just like um Oh yeah. Yeah, she just cut my she cut my cornea uh about a week or two ago and just on accident just I say on accident, but you never know with that child. Maybe uh, she was looking behind your shoulder as you're looking at, you know, the get <laughs> tough. Or, or I was like, well, I, I was asleep. So, like, <laughs> it was oh, okay. fucking cold, man. It's ice cold. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, she she provided me with the uh, with a lovely double abrasion across the uh, the right pupil. And I will tell you this: if I were in a knife fight, if or if I'm in a street fight of that kind, after that experience, I'm going for the eyes. There's nothing more disabling than that because it, it's not, it wasn't like, it's not just that your vision goes, but it like, it jacks up like your sinuses and your breathing patterns and like, ca- here's a, here's a tidbit speaking of evolutionary biology. So there's something that I experienced with that, with, uh, with an eye injury, you, you could call it, or an eyeball injury, a corneal, uh, uh abrasion such as that. Mm-hmm. Um, one experience I had when, on, when like, my vision has been like completely compromised and I couldn't hold my eye open is that a your, your injured eye is obviously completely disabled, but then your other working eye is now like hypersensitive to light. 
So you can't really keep that open either. And I will say that like I experienced like a world of a I could not fend off the anxiety. There was like almost like a panic um that comes with it that's like um it's hard to describe. I had never experienced it before, but I'm, I'm, this is a theory, but I think on a psychological level, when your eyes are disabled like that, I think that it I think that your brain is you you're forced to go into a state of like some kind absolute of absolute panic anxiety. like absolute like yeah like this is like i'm as vulnerable under, as a, yeah like you could not be more attack. vulnerable one of your senses has been removed or or disabled from you therefore yeah. like you you are now as vulnerable as your prey you're yeah, one step you closer to it, prey yeah and when you think about it like when it comes to your senses like uh sight I feel is like the most like precious to a lot of people. Oh, like, I totally I mean, agree. Like that is like, if there was a big explosion and then like, you couldn't hear anything, like you wouldn't be as distraught if you looked and there's just a flash of white light and then you couldn't see. Cause like the explosion, you could just still be like ee, ringing in the ears. You're like, what's going on? Like you still like, you can like grab someone and like, shake them and, be, like and then yeah, like you pick up a piece of paper and like write something down. You're just like, what well, you could read it. A, a lot of human communication is through facial features. Oh um, no, no, hold on! I want to before you even before you take that away. I want to because I don't want you to move off of that really quick. I just wanted to to add to that. It's not just facial features. Like what set us apart on an evolutionary scale um, was actually I learned this. Um, I believe it was it might have been Robert Sapolsky. Um, forgive me if I, this is impromptu, but um, one of the things that set us apart in the evolutionary process that like helped push us out of the food chain on the evolutionary timeline was when we began to develop the whites of our eyes, because then um, imagine, imagine a chimp, right. Who's, uh, who's, you know, we're, we're jumping back on the evolutionary scale on the timeline. Mm -hmm. Now, if their eyes are all there, if you don't have whites of your eyes, you can't, um, you can't communicate to the to the other species around you what you're looking at, oh. or at least not, or at least not as effectively. So, not like, like directly, right? So, when we started to develop the whites of the whites of our eyes, we started like it's like it's called like um it's called like optical targeting or something like that. It's like a it's like a unspoken communicative um, process that like happened in our evolution that kind of set us apart where we could we became it was like this spark that produced tribalism where we started like right. communicating you can, you with can one communicate another. just by looking at stuff you could all like, look at each other then look over there and then everyone's yeah, like, yeah yeah oh so, so you're, you're yeah touch. like imagine like imagine like a um you know imagine a a, a resource of some kind or a you know, uh, some kind of base or, or, or just something, whatever you're trying to communicate that you're looking at, that's like the beginning stages of communicating in like inner species. And then therefore, if you can communicate with your species, with the same species using your hands, your feet, your actions, and on top of that, what you're looking at without words or language, like now you can start forming tribes and alliances. Um, right. And, and this was, this was a big thing. And uh, this is why the, uh, this is why the eyes are as important as, as uh, your vision is as, as important as any sense can get, but like the evolution of like eyesight and what our eyes look like is along with that, along with the facial expression communication you were just, you were discussing. I, I didn't mean to tangent, but I, I, no, I no, wanted no. to add to that. Yeah, no, it's pretty much just like the most important thing that like, so it makes sense if you get like even a little, if it's under attack, like your body's like, you know, if this goes like, I don't know what to do for you, man. I can't really help you if I <laughs> yeah. can't help you see, bro. Yeah, I mean, on on a on a human level, the eyes are is is like I think it was in office. I think it was in the office, but like Dwight's just like talking about Dwight Schrute's talking about just going for the eyes, and it's like that's just the most terrifying thing. Like you sound murderous as soon yeah. as you like want to target. You're like the literally eyes. just trying to maim someone, if not kill them. Yeah, I mean that's essentially what's happening because like you render them basically useless once you're especially. I mean, blind people actually learn to live like pretty comfortable lives. Yeah. Well, you and, don't in five now. minutes and especially, if but exactly five, kill you. right. Right. Immediately under pressure. Like, well, yeah. even, even if you're not like, imagine, I would imagine that the first like couple of years of being blind is probably as hard a life as you can imagine it to be. Dude, that's, I imagine it's one of the most, I can't think of something more depressive and 
probably the last tangent I'll go on on eyes. Um, eyes are one of the few areas of the body with immune privilege. Oh, uh, really? Turns out that's not a good thing. Um, immune pr privilege is um, they are uh, you don't have antibodies in your eyes. It is seen okay. So, but I'm I'm curious because. I'm curious what you mean by uh, immune. Well, I, 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 the, so the term immune privilege I'm I'm familiar with, but I'm wondering how it applies to eyes and their their here's what happens. lack of it. Um, it will not automatically heal. Your like uh, your antibodies see your eye as a foreign object. Oh, I see. So you're talking about it, infection. Yes, if it I registered see. your eye as a object it would do too much damage to it it would it like it would mess up your sight too much so um it's just out of sight out of mind in the yeah. immune system when well it's so that... interesting too it's interesting too that you say that because it's one of the <clears throat> so with my injury and i hate to be further anecdotal but I'll, I'll i'll just continue for the sake of conversation but um that was, we, we actually, my wife and I called the nurse's hotline because like, I just couldn't, like, I, I just assumed that like, I just got a bad eye poke. I didn't know that anything truly happened, but we didn't really know what to do because my vision wasn't restoring after a couple hours. So I was like, all right, we got to do something here. So we called the hotline and they were just like, yeah, you need to go to the hospital now because you yeah. need the antibiotic drops immediately to avoid yes. uh, infection because you'll, you could literally lose sight forever, mm -hmm. which is like, that's fucking terrifying. As far as I'm oh, yeah. concerned, just something as small as an eye poke, you could lose your sight for forever. But interestingly enough, avoiding infection, I wonder if, and I wonder if this uh, plays into the immune, um, the immune response of the, of the eyeball without infection, because um, as I was told by my, by the, my doctor is that like your eye actually heals fastest um, undergoing uh, REM sleep cycle. It like, makes sense because it's just sitting there running, moving around really fast. Yeah, it's undergoing some kind of process, and and it, it, and, it and it's true. I mean, I literally slept. I slept for the entirety of the day intentionally um, to see just to test this theory because he said the you'll sleep a couple nights and you'll be back to one hundred percent. And I just said screw that, I'll sleep all day, and I did. And then I woke up the next morning after like basically eighteen hours of sleep, and my eyesight was completely restored. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was amazing. So, like, the eyes are just... Um, dude, we should do an entire podcast on fucking eyesight and, like... You know, they're actually attached. They're, they're, are, they're made of the same matter as your brain. Like, they are... It's, ew, they are brain ew. matter. Ew. Yeah, oh, yeah. Gross. Yeah, it's a little gross to think about. But they are... They're directly attached to the brain, obviously. Um, and, but they are... They are the sa of the same organic matter. As, I feel like as, you can't talk about eyes without talking. That, that's a good point that eyes are like brain matter because I feel like you can't really talk about eyes in depth without talking about psychology because mm, we're all just sure. looking at a, uh, it's all fake. We're all looking yeah. at <laughs> We're all looking at our interpretation of it's a simulation. the universe. That, exactly. Yo, I don't, don't well, like, we're not going to go into simulation theory on this podcast. I'll tell you that right the now. Next, I'm going to halt that in the tracks. All I know is that, uh, what happens is is uh, it, eyes and stuff like that that don't have the uh, auto that don't have like your immune system intact. If you perforate that membrane and then your immune system gets into it, it's like a field day. It's like oh, this is all bad. So like your eye won't heal naturally. Like under like if you have like severe damage to it, it's not going to like heal. It's just going to like heal over kind of like that's the best thing you can hope for but it's not yeah. going to it'll uh, like prevent further penetration or like further um further injury but like it's actual dude, dude like, sticks a dirty finger in your eye you're gonna die without antibiotics like, jesus christ dude. and that's that's and circling circling this train right back onto the tracks is, and that is exactly what is uh part of the the uh Fairbairn commando style fighting is, you know, I mean, it's basically just gouge eyes, kick, kick balls, uh, yeah, judo throws, him, judo hit chokes, him, hit them underneath the chin, gouge them in the eyes. And then like, that's if you don't have a knife, if you have a knife, yeah. just and if you got a knife, you've got about, you got about three very important places to stick them. Number one is the neck. Take the thrill. Fucking amazing. So, um, well, listen, we are, uh, this podcast is going to be a little shorter than, than our uh, previous episodes, which is probably actually a good thing. We have something we've been targeting. Um, 
but we're not finished yet. We're just going to take a short break. We're going to circle back. We will, uh, We'll talk a little bit about the impact that William Fairbairn had on the uh, on the world of self defense in his um, you know in his posthumous um, his, in you know posthumously. But uh, let's take a short break, Errol. We will be right back with you guys in just a few minutes to discuss the later years, the death, and the posthumous impact of William E. Fairbairn. Ain't that weird? folks we're back um so this has been the episode regarding our uh our um content of the day william e fairbairn um contributor to self-defense to commando style fighting um weaponry blade weaponry spe- more specifically um special ops army officer of uh great stature um had a huge impact on the world of combat for sure um Let's talk a little bit, Errol, about uh, let's talk about the commando knife, the stiletto style fighting dagger used by British Special Forces in the Second World War, also known as the Fairbairn Sykes fighting knife. This thing was uh, a thing of beauty. We mentioned it a little bit earlier, but um, this thing is like the fact that it's still in service, uh, specifically in uh, the UK, um, speaks a lot to the design of that weapon. I mean, it's got like this. Uh, uh, it's a double it's double bladed which or double edged i think is the term for it um which is just makes it all the more deadly um what do you think about this thing and its design yeah that's the thing if someone goes to reach at you or like if you go to stab someone with that and they like reach at you, you can't grab that nope. losing losing the hand doesn't um, there's no outside of it that's safe I really like the idea of the double blade, especially in like a life or death situation, because like sometimes you flail and miss. And then just the fact that you can come back if you just have like, you know what I mean? Um, It's a absolutely though designed for poking, for piercing a quick uh, dispersion. Um, Mm -hmm. But like the way you can wield it and the way like it's kind of intended in a knife fight. uh, What? Yeah. Mr. Fairburn uh, would say is uh, you do, you got to keep the knife moving and you got to keep like yourself moving. So you hold uh, you hold the knife in your hand. So it's just like foil vertical. grip. Yeah, Ver- vertical. Uh, and then when you hold your hand parallel, it should be parallel with the ground. And then uh, so like yeah, you turn your wrist sideways, cut to the right then turn it uh, face down and then like cut to the left and then you just like, keep turning your wrist like that and uh really good do you for think that. do you think that the design the the development of the design of this knife was intended for for uh trench warfare um and then was 
it was still implemented for hand-to-hand combat specifically actually it was utilized quite a bit in the normandy landings in 44 um but like do you think that it was more like optimized or intended to be optimized for trench warfare being that like fair baron's uh military experience was in korea in world war one and that's they're kind of gearing up for that too like towards um like when they made the knife like wasn't like during world war ii if i'm not mistaken like that yeah i don't think trench warfare was as much a part of world war ii or i mean it was don't get me wrong it wasn't like you know it was it was also you know a part of the world war ii story but like world war one was entirely trench warfare um uh what's it uh wars it was a war of attrition um i'd like slow to think, paced trench i'd like trench i like to think that the smash it was more uh more a, a product of world war one a little bit more uh a little more, more sauce on that one huh the smash and it like, i think it's like cool a, and it's like a utility tool so right, like yeah. you're trying to like you know um, heavier too i cut, believe right because it's a bit of a, it's more like a machete than it is, a, or it acts as more of a machete. Um, but it was considered it was well, yeah. There's your answer right here. It was developed in the in that time frame during World War II, but it was a trench knife. So it was based on it. It was based on a trench knife. Its design. So like clearly, it had um, um, it had designs that were um, you know inspired by like bayonets on rifles and uh, trench warfare from a previous a previous era, but. Badass yeah, I combat think the, knife. I think the uh, Fairburn uh, Sykes knife was uh, designed to uh, to make up for all the stuff that the Smatchet couldn't do. Like, you couldn't stab with it. You couldn't be like fast with it. No, it was, um, the blade was longer too. The double edged blade on the FS fighting knife was like a much long, elongated version, and it was also a more narrow it was it was it was meant for less of the brute force that the smash it was probably used for whereas like this was this was knife fighting this was like stick your stick your opponent stick your assailant and move like you were just saying right. it was it was more it was that old muhammad ali stick and move yeah and that's the thing too if you could like uh if you can reach in it's borderline like fencing if they're like swinging something and you just like poke and then like you know get back right. It was more of a dagger, really, right? Like the smash it was like a machete, and this was a dagger, um, designed designed for you know quick movements um, from the holder. But badass looking knife. Um, let's. Um, sorry, I want to keep. Uh, I want to keep keep rolling a little bit more towards the impact side of uh, what Fairbairn offered. And I mean, and not to say that this wasn't a part of that story because it definitely was. Like this was a very um, this is a weapon that's the FS fighting knife is like still a part of the military equipment in the UK today. So um, definitely still part of that. But um, the books on self-defense were pretty huge too. I mean, he went on to like train, uh, didn't he, he, he did training in like Singapore. Is that right? Um, in the uh, police force riot squads. Oh yeah. And then he was also, um, I don't want to say closely linked with uh who was it uh francois de Alescu. but he was also like an american uh u.s ranger who same kind of uh same kind of mentality kill or be killed and he taught a lot of all over the world and he ended up i believe like and they get like fort bragg doing stuff but like they these people are like the grandfathers of like uh just like like modern modern like combat like uh there's a couple like shooting things and the shooting things aren't so much like uh it's it's more honestly the stuff is more applicable it feels terrible to say but more applicable in like a united states like day-to-day kind of like just kind of like pistols thing as it would as opposed to like a military engagement now because most military engagements now if you look at yeah, what's yeah. happening in like Ukraine, dude, five hundred yards at least. Like, there's, yeah, this should the, the hand to hand combat. The hand to hand combat days are kind of a thing of the past for now. It will still happen. It will still happen. Like people get close. Oh yeah, no, but, it's not. It's not obsolete, and it's not unuseful for soldiers to learn because I think they, I think they get a lot of utility out of it. Um, just as a, just as a means of like, just being an all well rounded soldier. Um, and having, you know, having tactics across the board in, in any scenario is, is good to have. It also, like, 
boosts the, you know, you got to imagine it boosts the confidence of the soldier to know that like if shit gets dirty in, in tight quarters, like to, to know they're trained for those scenarios is probably like a good confidence booster for them to, to perform any other duties. But um, no, I, I totally agree. Like the, the state of warfare now is just so, um, it's so distance heavy and it's so technology and the weaponry is obviously so much more powerful and so much more. I fight a drone. Yeah. Not even just drones, but just even just the rifles um, and just the military grade weaponry is just so designed for uh, long range kills that like, it's not, um, it's not as uh, it's applicable is the wrong word because it's applicable in the scenario in a military scenario where you would need one. It's just not utilized as much. Nowadays, if you're killing someone with a knife, like you're, you're probably a, you're probably a dick. Not only that, if you're killed somebody, if you're killing somebody with a knife, if you're in a knife fight in the military, something, somebody, whether it was your leadership or it was somebody in your uh, platoon or somebody did something fucked up, somebody or went you're wrong. both literally just the nicest soldiers, like we both. Da, 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 boom out of ammo like he comes to hit you with the bayonet like you hit his out the way and then you pull mm. your k bar and then he pulls his <laughs> the k bars <laughs> yeah <laughs> he pulls his and he just go to you like it someone <laughs> has to die now mm. but here's the thing yeah, it's interesting i mean those scenarios probably still do exist in combat today but not as not, clearly this is not as that's useful. like the most romanticized thing like you know yeah. call of duty yeah. You both go to shoot each other, and then you look mm-hmm. around, and it's just everyone's dead, and you throw the guns down. You're like, why are we even doing this kind of thing? Like, there's almost no reason to – I don't want to say no reason. I've never I'm, I've never had to fight for my life or anything like that. But I don't imagine, no. like you said, with the guns, there has to be some kind of logistics thing. Well, you, like, have you seen uh, – did you see All Quiet on the Western Front, the uh, remake, um, the German remake from yeah, last year? Wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the one from the 30s with, like, fucking mm. – uh, I can't remember who. Yeah, like, no, the one last year. Yeah, the one that just came out, and the, obviously, I was. Well, you just reminded me that, like, when it came down to it, like, would they just like drop their arms and be like, "Why are we doing this?" It was like that reminded me of the scene in that film. Spoiler alert for any of our listeners: uh, bow out now if you haven't seen the film and you but and you don't want it ruined. But it, not not that it destroys the plot, but there's a scene in which, like, do you remember the scene in which the uh, the main one of the main characters is like in a true knife fight in a not even a trench it's like a it was a a, a bomb strike like yeah it was in a yeah in a not, uh, not a trench like a, what do you what would you call it like um a I dang just, hole <laughs> yeah <they're laughs> a dang hole there. in the soil and they're basically just uh they go hand to hand and like it is a vicious vicious stabbing sequence that's like um and the the because it it just showed the innocence of the main character and that he wasn't like a born killer and you know he didn't he was just a child basically a teenager in World War One and he stabs his assailant his his you know wartime opponent and doesn't know what to do he's just freaking out when his the guy he just stabbed is like slowly dying like in the movies in the real movies from that era and or not even that era, but from, you know, any war film you've seen somebody gets stabbed. They like, they die in a second, but there's that scene where he's just watching him die really fucking slow. And he's like, almost oh. like he's like, hope he's like, why aren't you dying? He like, was he's like, like, <laughs> bro. He's, he starts, he starts shoving mud into his mouth. Yeah. Cause he doesn't want to listen to him gasping for air anymore. He doesn't even try to kill him. He just doesn't want to hear him anymore. Like struggling. And he doesn't have like the decency that he doesn't know how to just he doesn't know how to kill. He doesn't know right. how to finish. And the guy's just looking um, at him. He's like, What's wrong with you? <laughs> he's yeah, like, it's Why insane. are you doing this to me? In but my that's opinion, that's, like, stab that's, me. Don't like throw a bunch of mud in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, he I mean, he literally tries to choke him with like mud in his mouth. It's one of the hardest scenes to watch in in the history of film. Like, not to make this about that movie, but like in terms of like hand to hand combat. Like while we're sitting here kind of cracking jokes about like what it would, you know, what stabbings and and chokes and and bones, you know, bone breaking, you know, all, we're 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 making light of like a very, very dark act and a very dark, you know, dude. Um, there so yeah, Jake, tactic. we joke. We do joke, but there's a lot of people in a lot of wards. Someone got figure like like twelve. <laughs> like <laughs> like that's figure 11 like that's happened to someone like, 
Bro, I'm not talking about that individual. I'm not I'm not being sympathetic to the man who got his ass tossed up in the air, spun around and dropped over a fucking knee. So it's like, yo, watch man, this. The only sympathy I have for that man is that like he missed his mark in the WWF in 1988. <laughs> he should have been somebody. <laughs> He would have been if he didn't have to fight for his country. Yeah, I'm talking about the other like 95% who were shot or stabbed in like trench warfare in one of the first two great wars. But no, yeah, if you got the old figure eight or you got tombstone or some shit. Yeah, like someone like they would have. Can you imagine? No, so here's the thing. Literally, I always felt like it was a really disingenuous thing for like wrestling to show that to like kids and like be like yeah this is like the cool thing we're doing like a tombstone you pick someone up you invert them and like granted the wrestlers are on the top down. of their head yeah so the wrestlers are dropping down to their knees but a real life tombstone like tombstone you're killing them get a yeah. tombstone like you listen are, i'm gonna be honest you- with you my little brother like he he was the recipient of like many a tombstone and a couple of stunners and like a couple of f5s and brother. like i'm telling you that poor boy like he I got in so much trouble because I actually hurt him, but like I always knew to do it like on a mattress or something. Like, but like, yeah, I always no, knew he, to drop him directly on his neck with the hundreds of pounds of us. <laughs> Just as long as there's a mattress under me. <laughs> no, he, I, I, I was aware enough, old enough, and aware of the the, the not realness factor, the right. disauthentication you okay, yeah, so you of like. So I knew like, okay, when I drop him down, I'm gonna when he when his head hits force him forward right like you drop on the top of his head but you as soon as his head hits you force him forward make sure his fucking neck doesn't get caught under there right yeah so yeah you it's go to, but fun. it's like you you slam him down yeah well you slam on his back like, yeah instead of i thought the f5 was, yeah <laughs> yeah i mean yeah if, if that happened to you in warfare sir i i still respect your your you know cr- your courage to fight for your country, but that's a fucking dishonorable discharge if you ask me. <laughs> you got all figure eighted. Yeah, like you don't oh. get any kind of uh any no, kind no of purple hearts after that. No purple hearts for that, but uh purple, no. Purple and, and we we joke and uh obviously obviously we joke, but like this uh the other aspects of like Fairbairn's tactical tact of um of knife fighting is and the commando style specifically is like very dark and harrowing and obviously probably but in in hindsight effective and probably you know you got to imagine this man with his tactics and how public he was with them how many lives do you think he saved i mean potentially hundreds of thousands maybe i mean I, yeah but how many people did he kill hundreds of thousands <laughs> yeah so it's like probably like six he probably saved like six people yeah, so he's it's got like a net. He's got a no, net save, net rescue prob- about it's six. Probably like negative because of We're fair. Like the amount of people, like he taught people how to kill effectively. Well, listen to this. Here, let me read this quote. This is from Get Tough by Fairbairn. Um, this is his rationale about what about the design of the uh, FS fighting knife, the Fairbairn Sykes uh, fighting knife. Um, This was the rationale he used in the book, Get Tough. Quote, in close quarters, fighting, there is no more deadly weapon than the knife. In choosing a knife, there are two important factors to bear in mind, balance and keenness. The hilt should fit easily in your hand, and the blade should not be so heavy that it tends to drag the hilt from your fingers in a loose grip. It is essential that the blade have a sharp stabbing point and good cutting edges, because any artery torn through as against a clean cut tends to contract and stop bleeding. If a main artery is cleanly severed, the wound, wounded man will quickly lose consciousness and die. So, end quote, by the way, that's um, that's a man looking for death. Like, he was he was in yeah. search of killing. Like he's, he's seen some people die. And also, I'm sorry, yeah. it wasn't like figure, I said like figure 11, it was figure 71, if you pick up the get tough. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, no, that's okay, I mean, if, if, if you get, listen, there's you're gonna. I'm sure figure eleven and any other, all the other figures are gonna are gonna bear some like pretty pretty uh, hilarious illustrations. But I mean, this dude is just a savage. I mean, in a lot of ways, like I, I do think that he was a little sick. I think he was pretty fucking bitter about like the like life threatening beating he took in Shanghai. But like, 
I wonder how, I mean, this is the complicated, like, uh, morality of, like, military warfare is, like, you just have, you have to create murderous men to compete, you know, to be, to be competitive in war, so to speak. But, like, um, I do feel bad for, for him in a lot of ways because it seems like he just, he made a life about, like, and obviously he rationalized it with, like, being developing self-defense right you could say you could say like he wanted to do it but like he went in the military under (laughs) age like you know like how much (laughs) he really like the inspirations were probably pretty grim Uh, but now he's like known as arguably the toughest person during world war ii so how are you gonna be like the toughest person during like the roughest period (laughs) yeah but honestly I, i think it's interesting like he he's he could be known as that as the toughest person in World War II, World War One, that era. But most of that shit didn't even happen in the war. That his toughness was tested mostly in the streets of fucking Shanghai, as far as I can tell. I mean, six hundred plus knife fights or or street fights that resulted in scarring from the toes to the top of the head, like toes to the nose, toes to the nose, just scarred up, banged up. I mean, he he took. I mean, he took toughness to a, to a different level, but uh, anyway, well, his he he died tragically. I mean, he had a pretty good life. The fact that he lived to be seven was it tragic? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how. To, <laughs> well, I mean, it depends. Who I, if anyone else, uh, I mean, seventy five. This man died at seventy five, probably thinking to himself, like, I don't know. Those last ten years, he must have been like. Jesus, I'm fucking bored. <laughs> no, that's what I thought you were saying. Like he died tragically. Like I thought he died like same way. No, lived. I just mean that he died. Like his, uh, I guess you know that's a great that's a great point. I feel like people use a tra- you know tragically passed, like like tragic is a very specific way to describe a death, and I feel like like you should preserve that for like my my grandma tragically died at the age of 106. Or like, and, 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 and or it was like, tragic. It was tragic because it was tragic because she like slipped on a butcher knife. <laughs> or like, yeah, like, or like, my granddaughter tragically died in a Ferris wheel accident. Like that yeah. is. Like can that you? Is, can you? Is there any way to die at 106 that is truly tragic, or is like any way you go at that age? It's like it's not tragic. It's like it, even if it's like super violent or like abrupt. Like, I was just it, thinking, man, if you get even if you get hit by lightning at that point, that's just God taking you. Yeah, he said you've had enough. That's, that's <laughs> about enough. He's <laughs> calling your number. Yeah, you just like I'm trying to think of something. Like it may be like a nothing, no. There's no situation that you should be in, you know, at that age that would cause that. Because I was like shark attack. Then I was like, What are you doing at the what the hell are you snorkeling for at 106? <laughs> <Right. God damn. laughs> yeah. Skydiving accident. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, just any way you go at 106, it's like it's hardly a tragedy. You're you're 106. I mean, you got probably 30 more years than you probably you know should have expected in the first place. But I don't know. I mean, you oh. still could. You still don't want to go out like too painfully, like get yeah, captured say, by a roller coaster or something. No, nah, you guys can quote me right here. If I make it to 106, I will jump in a uh, in one of those okay. car shredders. Oh Jesus! Damn. Yeah, Why? I so will. So bro, if you're hundred, if bro, if you're hundred and six, you ain't jumping anywhere. You you can't even jump off the couch at that age. You're gonna need to be lowered into that car shredder by machine. <laughs> I'll, give it, I'll give it. I'll give it my old college try. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it goes. It's gonna look more like a tumble. You're just gonna. You're just gonna basically just like roll. You know, you're gonna tuck and roll out of a wheelchair. But I'll, I'll be there to watch it. first. I'll be Boy, there to watch it because you ain't not living. Will, me. Out of spite. Oh yeah, you're not gonna outlive me. I can't. I can't have it. You'll be like, oh, episode six. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> you said that we. You said you would jump right in here. It's gonna be. You imagine perfect, we're still podcasting? This perfect episode. Episode, <laughs> episode two thousand seven hundred twenty-seven. Errol, what do you say? We just commit suicide on the airwaves today. <laughs> My name, welcome to, my name's Errol, welcome to Jackass, I mean, <laughs> peripheral views, <laughs> wheel into a, get encouraged, wheel to a trash compactor. 
Oh, oh man! If you do a callback a hundred years, eighty years from now, or whatever it would be, I know no one was looking for it or even thought it would happen. But for the one person who thought they were slick, here we are. You thought I wouldn't remember. <laughs> now my memory is not what it used to be, but I'm pretty sure back in the day I promised I would, I would ride this wheelchair right into a. Uh, Right to a <laughs> trash compactor. <laughs> oh, man. Some kind of car disposal. Yeah. Oh, man. That's fucking... Yeah, and no, I'm like, all right, so not to be, like, too... What? Order. All right, this is going to be awful, because, like, what if there's, like, b- breakthrough? We can, like... We can be, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, what are you at, Slate? No, you signed up. Like, he signed I'm up like for it. I'm 106 it. years old, but I'm like the same. Like we're you're like fucking this, spry as a fox. We're the same age we are now, just in better shape. And I'm like, yeah. oh man, no, there's no way we got to delete that episode. No one's gonna. <laughs> like, oh, call me out on it. <laughs> the inter- the internet doesn't. The internet remembers. And then there's like a we're like trending on Twitter. Kill yourselves. <laughs> Ten, <laughs> million episode. Ten million episodes. Ten million episodes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that's um, interesting hypothesis. But anyway, I, so. I can't even say short of like miraculous technology. Technology now, one hundred, hundred and six, while actually it's being not, young, it's not that crazy. I mean, I mean, man, well, it went down. Happened. It went down though. Like life expectancy, at least in the U.S., went down. But that was because of all the goddamn like ODs and suicides and shit. But there's like a, it's not to, the, it's not the technology. It's more well, it is in in part, but like it's more so like. Like there's like I was talking about in the previous episode, like the um the doctor uh, Dr. Peter Atia, who like focuses on longevity as like a he's like his like mission in life with his patients is to like turn them into centenarian he's, he calls it like the centenarian Olympics, mm-hmm. where he has like these tasks that he has like you know his older patients like what they want to be he like does like a survey for them and like gives them like a bunch of like small time activities. Um, that would seem small for like a 40 year old or a 50 year old, but like when you're a hundred, they would obviously be like, what do you want to be able to do when you're a hundred? Do you want to be able to carry a, like you, carry your groceries into your home by yourself? Do you want to be able to lift a uh, bag of luggage up a broken escalator? Like these high, types high of high dive. <laughs> yeah, World no, record horse, high dive. Horse dive. Horse dive. Call back to a previous <laughs> episode. Um, you, Swan <laughs> if you're 103 years old and it's like it's like 103 this time but it's not a high dive it's a swan dive it might be a swan dive it, it, it <laughs> might it might start as a high dive attempt high dive into a swan song <laughs> fuck it it's midway down well you've always heard that like uh have you heard that like thing about like the golden gate bridge about how like people who jump and survive they always they say that they like oh, regret it. you mean the statistic that 100 100 percent of people who have they been, always uh, regret it surveyed and survived said they no. regretted it like, they, so they also they also say that like it never they, like it takes like the amount of time whatever it's, it's like it's like estimated that it would be like it's like a nine second fall or something like that and they're just like they cannot believe they think it's minutes like time is like this crazy experience. Like they think it's they think they're falling for like multiple minutes, but it's it's under ten seconds. Ew. Yeah. Yeah. It's so dark. that I I like to assume that like everyone regrets it when they jump off. Yeah, I mean that's a that's actually well, it's not a it's not a dark statistic. It's actually a very like enlightening one. It's like very um it's a pretty optimistic viewpoint, like you know. Anybody who's anybody who's struggling out there, and so for our next sponsor, Better Health. <laughs> if you need somebody to talk to, you, uh, no, Better Health is actually pretty great. But uh, circling back, let's let's close this thing out. What do you say? This has been a, a wild ride um, of a podcast, but uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, William E. A. Oh, I'm sorry, William E. Fairbairn passed away tragically or otherwise, uh, age 75 in uh, Sussex, England, Worthing. Um, specific, more specifically, Worthing, um, 75 years old, had an incredible life. I mean, one of the, uh, a complicated life. You wonder how much, like, fucking enjoyment he got out of it. It doesn't sound like a whole lot, but 
Yeah, you say that, but what if he just loved it? He loved every what second. If he, I'm pretty sure he was just. You don't do that your whole life and make movies about it and stuff and not be about the smoke. Yeah, he wanted the smoke. He definitely wanted that smoke. He thought about it on his deathbed on his way out. Yeah, he's like, you're lucky. That he was thinking about every kill, every kill on the way out. He's like, if that doctor comes back in here with that needle one more time. I'm going to take him out myself. <laughs> <laughs> they, they might have. They might have to defend themselves. Man, uh, he, no, was sitting, like, he was sitting there thinking about every kill with just a massive erection. <laughs> just ar- he's arguably the grandfather of SWAT, grandfather of MMA, grandfather of uh, what was the other one? There's another one, uh, dude. I was gonna say Krav Maga. Knife fighting in general. Uh, police riot squads. Police riot squads. Like he was like he kind of developed some of the first anti riot squads. Um, in uh, China, so I mean, just a yeah. massively influential person, large, largely. Errol, this was your suggestion to to discuss him, and um, as soon as you mentioned him, I didn't even know I had not heard of his name, which is kind of shocking. Um, it's not shocking that someone wouldn't, someone even myself would not have heard of him. Not not to say that I've, I would have, you know, I should have heard of him, but like, um. It's amazing. What's amazing is that he's not more well known for his contributions to the uh, to the craft of killing. Oh yeah, no, it's definitely a shame. Um, the one of the places I uh, found him on, or at least I was uh, looking into him at, was uh, Forgotten Weapons on YouTube. Uh, oh, okay, very very good channel. Forgotten nice Weapons. Plug. Yeah, no, it's a uh, wicked sick. Uh, I he's all his videos are really great. Uh. He's a curator, or at least he goes to a lot of curated places with these weapons, and he just talks about them. He talks about, like, the historical significance, and then, of course, um, he was talking about, like, the uh, uh, the Fairburn uh, uh, Sykes knife, and then went into just the, you know, the him being the f- father of modern SWAT tactics in general, or at least uh, the backbone of it couple other plugs i'd like to make wasn't able to get them at the library uh wasn't able to get them in time but uh the legend of uh, william e fairburn gentleman and warrior the shanghai years by nicholas tyler and uh, peter robbins would be a, a great way to uh to start that if you wanted if you're really interested in them and then also uh the world's first swat team we fairburn by leroy thompson senior um also another book that i was not able to get my uh mitts on in the meantime but i would like to uh, read that if you're looking more into it but honestly if you just type uh, william fairburn you're gonna get a you'll get a bunch of videos um roughly surmising what we said here uh some of them a lot more uh, in-depth than others uh definitely like the uh, forgotten video is gonna be pretty in-depth um and then you'll also get a lot of stuff for the old-timey videos so that's yeah that those stuff's are great, actually yeah. kind of they're kind of fun. Well, like john ford the one he did with john ford is um i don't know if that, did you find that one on youtube the john ford videos i didn't find the exact one they did but i found the next one that he did with uh what was his name did i delete them all on time oh no give me a second He does it. He did another one with a different gentleman. I think uh, I can't think of the gentleman's last name. That's all right. We can plug it in the uh, in the link. Um, no, it was uh, it was uh, Rex Applegate, killer, or killer get killed. Okay, uh, got it. Beautiful. Well, we'll plug that. Uh, maybe we can include that. I've been trying. To, I've been trying to remember to include links to uh, certain things that we discussed in the podcast. That's still, that's forthcoming. Um, so um, yeah, that's an important important note um, that I want to hit on before we close out. Is that uh, we are? I forgot to mention this at the beginning, and I want to mention it now. We are working on um, the the website for the podcast is officially underway. We have like actually, I've actually personally started developing um, a website for the podcast. It's a little ways out. It's going to take me some time to get it just right the way I want it. Um, you know, Errol and I are both busy, but we're working hard to uh, get that developed. Um, and once it is, we're going to have 
uh, hopefully all of our source material will be included. I will try to retroactively include some show notes for each episode um, best I, as best I can. That might take us some time. I'm hoping to have all of that um, launched and in, in good to go. Um, the website will be launched for sure in the next few months. Um, I would say in the next probably eight weeks or so, somewhere in that range. Um, looking for an opportunity to, to spend a weekend on it and actually finish it up. But um, other than, but that aside, the full development where I go back and retroactively pump in some show notes for each episode, that I'm looking to do, I'm looking to have that completed and everything will be caught up hopefully by the end of the year. That's our goal. We're going to keep pushing this podcast as long as we can. Um, hopefully you guys are enjoying what you're hearing from us. Um, and we're, as, we're trying to be as entertaining and also as informative as, as we can on, on each episode. But um, Errol, do you have anything else you want to add? I wanted to close this, uh, close out our story here with, uh, we're going to take a short break in a moment. Um, but before we, uh, before we do that and discuss what's coming next on the peripheral abuse podcast, Errol, anything you wanted to uh, add to the life of William E. Fairbairn before we close him out? Honestly, no, not much that I can think of right now. Um, yeah, we touched, we touched upon most of what, what what's actually documented on his life. So. Um, so why don't I do this? I'll just close this out with a, I'll close this out with a quote by the man himself. Um, this is from All in Fighting. Um, quote: It will soon be found that the principal value of the training lies not so much in the actual physical holds or breaks, but in the psychological reaction which engenders and fosters the necessary attitude of mind, which refuses to admit defeat and is determined to achieve victory. End quote by William E. Fairbairn. With that, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back after this break to talk about what's coming next on the Proof Reviews podcast. Please hang tight, and thanks again for listening. From the break, thanks again for listening to the Peripheral Views podcast. Uh, today's episode on William E. Fairburn was a pleasure to discuss. Uh, Errol and I had a bunch of uh, fun talking about it tonight. Um, even with the struggles of kind of being able to pull apart, um, you know, quite an intense story, but like there just wasn't a world to, to work with in terms of resource material. But we had a lot of fun. The impact was so big, there was enough to discuss to that we felt it was worth a podcast. And, um, you know, his, his lasting legacy and uh, what he left behind in terms of, you know, hand-to-hand combat and military tactics, they were, uh, they were pretty plentiful and definitely worth discussing. Uh, closing out the show today, or tonight, I should say, um, is uh, let's talk about what's upcoming. We've got a big, big, big episode, probably our biggest yet. Uh, one I look forward to the most, I would say, um, in terms of the content and uh, the construction or the uh, format, we're going to discuss uh, and then our next episode later this week. We're talking The Lighthouse 2019 psychological th- uh, thriller from director Robert Eagers. We're going to discuss that with our buddy Steve Monderville. He's going to jump on and we're going to do a guest spot with him. He's uh, he's going to 
provide some commentary on the film. Um, it's a big film. We kind of started pulling it apart in our previous film episode. Uh, Errol, are you excited about this one coming up? Dude, I'm kind of scared. It's a lot. It's one of those films that like, <laughs> it's, it's a film that I genuinely think there's, um, there's so much to discuss that like uh, it is, it does feel, it feels like it's going to be very difficult to tackle it all. And it's also, there's so much, there's a lot of theory and um, you know symbolism and uh, there's just a lot going on with the film to, to pull apart and to kind of uh, wax lyrical about. So, uh, but we'll do our best with Steve. Steve's a, Steve's a smart guy. He's got, a, he's going to have a lot to say about it and he'll, he'll, he'll be willing to go to the, uh, to the deepest ends of that pool with us. So uh, we're going to do that on fr- uh, this upcoming Friday. That should be released um, by the end of the, either by the end of the weekend or by Monday. Um, that is the lighthouse. So 2019 um, horror film, psychological thriller, or something along those lines, a survival, uh, survival film, character study, whatever you want to categorize the film as it is a masterclass in acting and direction um, and we're going to talk that film to death uh, come Friday night. So that is up de- up on deck. Um, following that, Errol and I are going to dive into our back into the music series. We're going to talk about Lupe Fiasco, one of our favorite artists of all time. Errol and I grew up listening to Lupe Fiasco together. Um, you know, we were in high school when he was uh, when he was pumping a lot of mixtapes and music out, and we've we've uh, we've had a lot of experience pulling apart his lyricism and his storytelling and just his music has just really soundtracked Errol and I's uh, friendship. I would say, what do, you, do you think that's an accurate way to put it? Yeah. Yeah. There's not like a lot of other artists who have kind of been there the whole time though. Yeah. Ever since we've been friends since, since like high school, it's just been, it's basically just been like, he's been like kind of just, you know, he's been, he's been playing in the background of, of our, uh, of our lives for a good 10, 15 years now. It's pretty amazing. So um, we're going to talk about the uh, Lupe Fiasco's The Cool, um, uh, his 2007 uh, sophomore album that came uh, to, you know, he had a lot of mixtapes before that, um, but he's, this album was a concept album. Errol, uh, what gets you excited about talking about that thing? Um, Just the fact that like, uh, here's, I didn't even know it was a concept album until like I looked it up and stuff. You can kind of tell that there's like an overarching theme. Mm-hmm. but it is uh for what it is it's it's really good it's uh yeah, it some is. of the songs like are standalone very good so when you put the whole thing together it's like le- legitimately i would i would say it's like a work of art yeah yeah it's a it's a it's a masterpiece in its own in its own bizarre little way and it, it's you know much like the lighthouse i feel like it was like i'm glad we're doing those kind of back-to-back not that they have they have absolutely nothing to do with one another and really there's no cross section of like uh material in that way i just i just mean to say that they're both like classics from an era and they're kind of underlooked and we errol and i probably i, I don't know if you would agree with this errol but i would say that we have like uh you and i have a uh, special interest in things that like uh in things that don't get the attention we feel they deserve and that's kind of what this podcast is is about is about uh, shedding light on things that you know pro- are critically acclaimed or maybe in the shadows of of the public are revered but don't quite get like the allure that they that they should and so this podcast is kind of like dedicated to like um shedding a little light on that do you think that's a good way to describe the podcast i don't know you tell me yeah yeah no that definitely um because uh anyone can look up a podcast and just look up current events and stuff. There's stuff going on. There's people who are smarter than us or more like informed in tune with it. Yeah. Just actually doing it that you could figure it out. Yeah. No, that's, I, I feel like what you said is very, uh, uh, on the nose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's just what we like to do is like, uh, you and I have always had interest in esoteric things. Uh, these next two, uh, these next two, um, episodes, I think are really going to like, um, exemplify what the podcast is about. Uh, two pieces of content, uh, film and album that are both classics, but don't get um, that just didn't get quite the attention they maybe deserved in our our deep intellectual and um, offer quite a bit of opinionated thought and discussion that we're going to try to 
we're going to do our best to, to tease it apart. And hopefully we do a, a halfway decent job of that as we've done in previous podcasts. So um, on that note, Errol, anything you want to add to, uh, to today's episode? No, not really. Um, oh, no, actually, yeah. The only thing I think I forgot was, uh, so like right before he was in Shanghai, like a little bit before that, it was, uh, the China was going through the Boxer Rebellion, probably like one generation before that. So he's just dealing with a, a bunch of people who already knew how to fight. A real, yeah, yeah. a real fucking savage populace. Your, your parents know how to fight. Like yeah. you know how to fight. I wouldn't say savage is a good word, but uh what's the word? I don't want to butcher it. Uh they were a uh, bellicose. Ah, bellicose. You know, you were trying to pull that word up earlier and I, I you you were blanking on it, but yeah, I think yeah. that's 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 a good word for it. Yeah, they were uh they would demonst- they were able to demonstrate aggression and a willingness to fight. Like they weren't they just weren't scared. Like, but they weren't like I don't think they're like, oh, gonna beat you up just to beat you up. They're like, what are you doing here? No, because that's that's what you think of when you think of savage. It's more so like um there's like defense involved and it's like not justified necessarily, but kind of justified. But uh no, that's a good tidbit, good place to add, you know, good spot to add that. Uh and um yeah an, an incredible life and uh during an incredible period of time that offers just so much historical um significance um basically the first 50 years of the 20th century are just so packed with unbelievable storytelling um you know i hope we can uh, i hope we can dive into to as many corners of that throughout the development of the podcast as we can but on that note, let's close it out. This is the uh, this is episode number seven of the Peripheral Views podcast, number three in the biography series on William E. Fairbairn and his uh, contributions to the world of hand-to-hand combat and abroad. So, um, thank you guys for listening. We really appreciate any support you can guys you guys can offer us. Um, closing out once again. If you want to hit us at Twitter, we are at Peripheral V one two three stream any of our episodes they are hosted on soundcloud at soundcloud.com forward slash peripheral views one two three um contact either jake or errol at the uh the podcast gmail which is peripheral views podcast at gmail.com um and if you happen to stumble upon this on one of our social uh social media accounts feel free to pop us into the apple podcast search bar or the spotify search bar and if you do happen to listen to us on those platforms please hit the notification bell and the subs- and please subscribe uh, leave us a review and a rating that would be super helpful for um, further exposure to our content. And we will keep keep the episodes coming. Um, episode 8 and 9 are ready to roll, and we will be recording those in the coming weeks. Thanks again so much for the support. Thank you guys for listening. And uh, we look forward to you on the next round of the Peripheral